I, I assume most of you have read um, some of the, the morning papers. So this is The Guardian from this morning, uh, 14, 14 pages uh, about this topic. Uh, also concurrently in the Spiegel, 17 pages, uh, the New York Times, I'm not sure how many, International Herald Tribune, and I believe the Telegraph also has it uh, on the front page, and I haven't uh, checked into the others. Jimmy, what do you say when uh, people like the White House accuse you of compromising the security of troops in Afghanistan by virtue of this yeah. leak? Yeah. We're familiar with groups whose abuse we expose, attempting to criticize the messenger to distract from the power of the message. Uh, and we don't see any difference uh, in the White House's response to this case um, to the other groups that we have exposed. Um, we have tried hard to make sure that this material does not um, uh, put innocence at harm uh, all the material is over seven months old, so is of no current op operational consequence, uh, even though it may be of very significant investigative uh, consequence. Hey, Julian. Um, it's Rafael Sander here with the Associated Press. Um, I'm curious as to whether you feel at risk at all or under threat, either here in the UK or elsewhere, as a result of this or the other activities. Yeah. From time to time, we have threat warnings from uh, our sources and uh, people in a position to know in government and um, some national security reporters. We take those seriously. Uh, in the West, uh, we haven't felt a threat to our personal safety. Um, in Kenya and other parts of the developing world, unfortunately, that has not always been true. Uh, we do have surveillance events from time to time, and there have been more in the past uh, few months. We understand uh, from the work of a national security uh, reporter uh, in Australia that the Australian government uh, was asked uh, by the United States uh, to engage in certain forms of uh, surveillance um, of my person and other WikiLeaks people in Australia. Um, that source says most of uh, those requests were rejected by the Australian government. What do you think this does to the stated aim of the UK, the US and other NATO allies that they want to leave the country? Do you think it helps or hinder, it hinders the eventual drawdown of British troops and American troops? I think it's too early to say yet. It's clear that it will shape an understanding of what the past six years of war has been like uh, and that the course of the war needs to change. The manner in which it needs to change is not yet clear. There have been a number of issues that have obviously been run through these um, leaks, um, but what do you think has been the most damning revelation? I'm often asked this question, what is the most single damning revelation? What is the thing that is easily capturable, the single event, the single personality, the single mass killing? Uh, but that is not the real story of this material. The real story of this material is that it's war. It's one damn thing after another. It is the continuous small events, the continuous deaths of children, insurgents, allied forces, the maimed people. Search for the word amputation in this material, or amputee, and there are dozens and dozens of references. So this is the story of the war since 2004. And like most of the accidents that occur on the road, are as a result of cars, not of buses. Most of the deaths in this war are as a result of the everyday squalor of war, not the big incidences. That said, of course, 
there are reports with high kill counts uh, in this material. For example, a single report uh, taking place in on August the 9th, 2006, has a kill count of 181. One wounded, one uh, one wounded, zero detained. What is the circumstance behind that report? Well, it's part of Operation Medusa, but the full circumstance is not yet known. According to the report, an AC-130 gunship is a cargo plane which has been fitted out with cannons all along one side, circled around for three hours and killed 62 of those people. If we add up all the deaths in that report, we get about 80. Uh, the deaths of the other 100 are still unexplained. There are many reports like that. They look, ex look very suspicious, but the full details are not yet explained. We can see uh, the behaviour of Task Force uh, 373, a special forces assassination squad, a kill or capture squad, uh, involved in pursuing the JPEL, the Joint Priority Effects List, a euphemism for the US assassination list, kill or capture list uh, in Afghanistan. There are many events associated with that, um, some that uh, resulted in the, the deaths of, um, one that resulted in the deaths of seven children and others that resulted in the deaths of a number of other innocents. Uh, for, that, for that list, we can also see how people get on the list. They seem to be recommended by regional governors in Afghanistan or by intelligence authorities, often with, it appears, little evidence and, of course, no judicial review. Um, um, can you say um, how you came to cooperate with uh, the New York Times, The Guardian, and the Spiegel? Yeah, so, so, I mean, that's quite an interesting journalistic story that we managed to pull together these four groups, Sunshine Press, WikiLeaks, uh, The Spiegel, New York Times, and The Guardian, uh, to share investigative resources. We shared research stemming out of this material, not um, final stories, but research and um, computational techniques uh, to deal with this material um, as equal partners, uh, with the exception that uh, we control the embargo date and could move that back and forth. Uh, we, uh, I spoke to uh, Nick Davies uh, of The Guardian, uh, who was instrumental in starting to broker uh, that arrangement, and then we did it at an editor-editor basis um, between the, uh, Alan Rostriger and the editor of The Spiegel and the editor of The New York Times. Julie, what's your quick question? Um, the MOD this morning, uh, are saying that even they aren't able to verify much of the documents. I'm sure the US would probably say the same about other documents too at this stage. How can you be sure that, that what's placed up on the internet is accurate? And if some of it is not, doesn't that eat into your legitimacy uh, with it? Because it's wrong information and therefore it's not there. If some of that information was inaccurate, uh, that would eat eat into our legitimacy, quite correct. Uh, however, we have never released misdescribed material and I don't expect this case to be any exception. So, some people are suggesting that lots of the intelligence, or some of the intelligence, it's difficult to quantify, uh, came from low level, came from yes, people that, who are, are biased yeah, against different groups. Absolutely. Groups. And so how can you rely on that? How can you allow people to read information and it placed up there as if it were truth? as far as you're concerned? When we publish material, what we say is the document as we describe it is true. We publish CIA reports all the time that are legitimate CIA reports. That doesn't mean the CIA is telling the truth. Similarly, with this material, there is reporting from military units of various kinds for in Afghanistan, reporting from US embassies across the world um, about 
matters relevant to Afghanistan, reporting from informers in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Those are legitimate reports. It doesn't mean that the contents are true. Um, so people should exercise caution. People should exercise caution, and I'll give you some examples of the ways in which they should exercise caution. And we, in fact, do this. Uh, if you go to wardiary.wikileaks.org, you will see our how to read the material report. You will find that US military units, when self-reporting, of course, often speak in exculpatory language, redefine civilian casualties as insurgent casualties, downplay the number of casualties. And we know this by looking, comparing these reports to the public record for wh where there has been comprehensive investigations. So as an example, Kunduz, Gorani, for the Kunduz report, we see that the initial report from the field was 56 insurgents killed, no civilians killed, but we know from later reportage investigation, in fact, most of the people killed were civilians and there was some hundred and something. Um, but when units report, when military units report on other military units, they are more likely to be frank on other US military units. When they report on other allied units that are not from the US military, for example, on the Poles or on the Brits, they are even more likely uh, to tell the truth. And of course, uh, when they are reporting on the Taliban, uh, then all the evil comes out. Um, similarly, when we look at reporting from informers, uh, we can see sometimes completely outlandish claims. Uh, they just don't hold water. It will sometimes say that that reporting is the result of the source being paid. It will sometimes, there is a rating system that uh, Marines Intelligence will give these sources how reliable they think they are. So that is the opinion of Marines Intelligence as to Marines G2 Intelligence, how reliable the source is and how much you should take away from it. Um, but just like dealing with any source, uh, you should exercise uh, some common sense. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, you should close your eyes. Julian, what have you learned about the Germans? Sorry. Phil Neddy from ITV News. Um, one of the statements the White House made immediately but with regard to the Pakistani uh, links, um, the guidance was, the opening sentence is, I don't think anyone who follows this issue will find it surprising. And I suppose that's what I found about this whole thing, that the, the detail is stunning in the 91,000 documents are stunning. And yet, in the end, there is so much that one doesn't find entirely surprising. I wonder if you've concluded that at the end of all this. And following on from my colleague about reliability, do you find it in any way suspicious that the documents that you've got here are all labeled secret but not top secret? They're all fairly low-level field reports. They come from junior officers. The only guy in jail is a private first class. I mean, have you, again, have you any feeling that perhaps you have reason to doubt the reliability of these documents? We have no reason to doubt the reliability of these documents. Uh, we should say what they don't include. Uh, they don't include top secret reports. Uh, they don't include most reports from US Special Forces. They don't include reports by the CIA. They don't include reports by other coalition partners. However, they do include the majority of regular US Army activity. And where regular US Army uh, overlaps in the activities of other forces in Afghanistan, it includes reports about their activities. So when Task Force 373, the Special Forces Assassination Squad, is involved in a raid, it will often partner with regular US Army forces, and so there are descriptions of its, its activities. Similarly, when the CIA is engaged in a raid, or a US Army bomb squad needs to be called in, or something like this, you will see OGA, uh, other government agency, um, a sort of cover 
typically for the CIA, sometimes for the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, uh, and you can see some information about the behavior of the CIA um, through this overlap with regular US Army activity. And the aspect of being surprised by the revelations. Oh. Should any of us be surprised? I'll, after I'll go on to the next question. In uh, what circumstances wouldn't you publish information, or are there any circumstances in which you wouldn't publish information? We have a harm minimization process. Our goal is just reform. Our method is transparency, but we do not put the method before the goal. We have a serious endeavor. We do things in policy. We do not do things in an ad hoc way. Uh, so, so far, our harm minimization procedures have always worked. To our knowledge, no one has ever been physically harmed by the material we have released, uh, even though we have uh, caused the change uh, of governments and many other serious reforms. Just a quick follow-up. Would you accept uh, Sorry. Uh, John Reese from the Top of the War Coalition. Uh, the material that you've released uh, applies to the period when the policy of so-called cautious restraint uh, was in place. That policy is now being lifted uh, by, the, by US forces. Do you expect that if there were similar re revelations in the future that the rate of Afghan civilian deaths would be greater than those you revealed in these documents? I don't know enough about that policy to, to comment meaningfully. Um, I can only say prima facie if uh, Restraints are reduced. There will be more civilian casualties. I was just speak BBC. Um, you talk about the uh, harm minimisation uh, policies. And this is only related to material before seven months ago. But how do you respond to the charge that you're in no position to know, particularly given the vast amount of uh, material out there, uh, what harm is being done to sources or, or potential sources in terms of that? And also on the historical point about it all related to the last year. How do you respond to the... One, uh, one question at a time. How do you respond to the point that um, the Obama administration uh, would argue that actually you say things must change, but they will argue that things have changed, that this all comes before the surge actually comes into operation? One of the interesting things that we have noticed from this material is that at the time that McChrystal took command with a stated policy intention of reducing civilian casualties, especially from airstrikes. Um, a new field appeared in these reports, a field of credible allegations of coalition forces causing civilian casualties. That appears to have been an attempt by McChrystal to get some handle on the situation to get some measure on where civilian casualties were, were occurring as a result of coalition activity. But what we see uh, is that the US Army is an enormous boat that is extremely hard to turn around. And the cover up of those sorts of crimes begins at the bottom and moves its way to the top. So it is quite hard to enact a new policy and have it filtered down to a change in practice. A new policy by Obama does not mean a change of practice by the US military any more than a new policy by McChrystal meant a change in practice uh, by US forces. So these are war crimes? Well, you said, sorry, you said cover up. I'll, I'll go, I already, so you already asked the question, so. Yeah, but it's an important uh, uh, thing. Julian, Chris, BBC Radio. Um, have you and have your partners published all the information that you gave them access to? And if they held back, what did they hold back on? And do you have more of this kind of material to come out? You've spoken about an <coughs> Afghan uh, video, uh, which WikiLeaks is uh, planning to release, I believe. Okay. WikiLeaks since December has been a bit on a bit of a publishing hiatus uh, in order to do significant re-engineering to cope with the level of submissions we were receiving and the level of um, public interest uh, in our site. 
is actually a very hard engineering task to supply 2 to 5 percent of the entire world uh, internet connected population at a single moment with material. Um, and so we're a small organization trying to understand how to do that and do that in a secure way. As a result, we have built up during that period an enormous backlog uh, of whistleblower disclosures. Additionally, after uh, the collateral murder tape came out which revealed how two uh, Reuters journalists were killed in 2007 in Baghdad along with 18 to 26 other people, um, we received a substantial increase uh, in the number of submissions. So now we have an enormous range of material we are trying to get through and trying to keep our promise to our sources in achieving the maximum political impact for that material. But in relation to these in particular, these documents in this, particular, have you released yeah, all of them? This is one of those cases. This is one of the cases of us getting through our backlog. Um, so we have released to the public some 76,000 reports uh, from this set of material. The set itself comprises of over 91,000 reports. We have held back about 15,000 um, reports of a particular type uh, to undergo a further harm minimization review. Um, and those <coughs> some of those reports will be redacted and released, released uh, as soon as uh, we are able to get through them. Uh, and Others uh, will be withheld until the security situation in Afghanistan uh, means that it is safe uh, to release them. And by safe, I do not mean safe for military forces. I mean safe for the local population of Afghanistan. Why, why did you call some of these, questions, these actions crimes just now and then decline to answer the question from my colleague as to what you I, I don't find that an interesting question. Well, hang on. You're here to talk about the freedom of expression. Yeah. You're Next. refusing to answer questions when they get difficult. That's a little hypocritical. No, you have to phrase your questions. You, you used know. the word crimes and now you're refusing to explain why. You have to phrase, you have to wait your turn and you also have if, to phrase your questions phrase, in a meaningful way. Crimes. You use the word crimes, not me. Do we have another question? You find that difficult? Um, just curious as to why you decided to limit your formal collaboration with three liberal media outlets. And, and as a new media platform, why specifically the focus on print? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a print journalist. I mean, I don't... We, we've had one video production so far, so we don't really know how to do a TV that well. Um, we had hoped to partner with um, a, a network to do a more significant investigation, but um, limited time and resources uh, eclipse that. We do hope to do that next time. Um, the reason why these three uh, organizations, um, obviously we can't have a, a, a journalistic coalition which is too large sharing everything equally for the logistical reasons, it just doesn't hold. Um, so when we're talking three or four, that we can actually get together into a room and agree on all the conditions. Um, those simply are, with possibly the exception of some French uh, publications, um, the uh, three, the best three research uh, publications in print. New York Times, The Spiegel and The Guardian. One of them is a German one. I just wonder, you mentioned the Kundus report earlier on as well. Um, how do you see the role of the Germans there as one of the Allied troops? And what do you think will be the reaction of the German public? The investigation of the Kundus event in 2005, which killed um, uh, over 100 people and approximately 60 to 80 civilians um, by the German press is an interesting case study because the German press investigated this with incredible thoroughness uh, that is not seen for any other single event in Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, and it, it's really, I suppose, a credit to the German press uh, to see that level of investigation. But it also speaks to some kind of market demand or cultural desire uh, in Germany to see 
um, those sort of crimes thorough, thoroughly uh, investigated where German forces play a part. Um, there, there are a number of reports that do concern German forces uh, and the regions where German forces are stationed, including Task Force 373, which is stationed or has been stationed uh, near a German controlled region. Um, Der Spiegel uh, has more on that issue. Um, I will let them speak for me. Uh, they know more about the details. Uh, public reading and censorship. Um, did you experience um, any approaches or attempts to um, to block publication from the U.S. government? And how far in advance were they aware of how much material they had? Um, obviously, we uh, are not in a position to say uh, what the United States government as a whole is aware of or not, it would simply be impossible. But um, uh, the New York, the, the media groups, including us, agreed that the New York Times uh, would approach the White House um, for comment and the Pentagon for comment, and that would comment would then come back and be shared amongst the others. Uh, that approach uh, took place in the middle of last week. Um, so they knew it at least since that point. Um, we haven't uh, had any um, direct uh, attempts to censor us. Like e every delicate investigation, we have, of course, held uh, things close to our chest, and so have the other media organisations. What, if anything, do you hope to change when it releases to court? Change your foreign policy, more information? higher public profile, yourself, the site? We give a promise to whistleblowers that come to us, that is our role as the International Public Service, that provided they meet some very simple criteria, like, like a lawyer, we will represent them fairly to the court, in our case, the court of public opinion. Uh, so this submission met that criteria and therefore we were tasked uh, to keep our promise of getting the maximum political impact for it. Uh, and I think we appear to be living up to that promise. That said, uh, of course, some material uh, calls out for more attention uh, and material which exposes significant human rights abuses uh, tasks us to spend more effort on it. Some, some of those will be 15,000 documents, something we're talking about earlier on. So presumably within those 15,000 or so documents, there are things that you maybe have already seen that might deserve some amount of attention. That being the case, um, and the fact that you get immediate coverage whenever these things happen, can you then therefore answer the question that's been asked twice already by a journalist? You mentioned the word crimes. Can you please just be a bit more specific about what you meant by are, are, are these crimes committed within these documents? Because unless the question's answered, how do you expect the media to take you seriously down the line when there are potentially more good what stories? What is your specific question? You mentioned uh, 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 a while ago war crimes or crimes when you were talking about the documents. You, didn't, you weren't specific. What I'm asking you is to be more specific when you talk about war crimes or crimes as a thing that you used. I think I was speaking about the issue in general. However, it is up to a court to decide clearly whether something is in the end a crime. That said, prima facie, there does appear to be evidence of war crimes in this material. An example is the Task Force 373 high Mars missile strike uh, on a house which killed seven children. Well, on, on the one hand, as we all know, the United Kingdom is a surveillance state. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we do have extensive uh, poli political, journalistic and community support uh, in this country. Um, and uh, it would only serve our interests, in fact, to be um, 
uh, well, for me to be arrested or detained. I, I can't imagine uh, that happening in this country um, I, uh, unless, unless there was a, a miscommunication from the bureaucracy to the political leadership. The political leadership uh, in this country would not tolerate that. The, um, the motives of, of, of WikiLeaks in all of this are, are, are well known and, and you've expressed them. I, I wonder, <laughs> without revealing your source on this, what, what your source's motives for, for, for releasing this material to you um, were, was a, was, a, was a motive expressed to you? Yeah, we, when we get submissions we typically get a statement. In fact, we uh, require usually a statement from the source about what they want us to do with the material and why it's important and so on. Um, so yes, the, the source wanted to call attention to a number uh, of these incidents. Um, uh, not, not all the ones that we have found, but um, uh, some of the ones that we have found and, of, and their perception was of course there would be many more and they appear to be correct. Will, Wiki, will WikiLeaks be helping out with Bradley Manning's legal case? Uh, yes, we have uh, committed funds uh, to uh, Mr. Manning's lawyer. Uh, we are his, his uh, JAG team, uh, and uh, they understand that those funds are available uh, at the point that he wishes to choose uh, to engage his civilian counsel. Uh, presently, um, uh, his JAG, U.S. military legal team, uh, has not chosen uh, civilian counsel. There are a number, there are over 50 uh, US embassy cables uh, in the material uh, that has been released already. Um, the majority of the material that has not been released yet are threat reports. Julian, you said earlier you weren't directly blocked to publish material. Could you give us an example of what <coughs> not directly blocked means or what do you experience? We experience certain you know, surveillance events from time to time. Um, and uh, our sources have told us something of the decision-making process that was occurring uh, some months ago within uh, the White House. Uh, I shouldn't really say more about that, um, uh, but that uh, the private statements are made uh, within um, the White House and State Department were um, concerning. Uh, however, those private statements have now synced up to the public statements which are acceptable, mostly acceptable. Yes? Okay, one of the papers you work with suggested that you um, have access to several million files um, which amount to <coughs> an untold history of American government activity around the world and that they'd be very controversial. Can you, can you confirm that and can you give us some flavour of why they're so controversial? We have, in this backlog that we have built up, we have uh, files that concern uh, every country in the world with a population of over one million people, um, including the United States. Uh, we won't go into further detail until that material is to be released. That it, it is not one thing about lots of places, but rather um, thousands of uh, databases and files about all sorts of countries. When do you hope to clear this platform? Well, we, we're working as hard as we can. You've got a big team. We have a small team of dedicated and overworked people. Uh, that said, we also have. Uh, around 800 volunteers, part-time volunteers, and an extended network of uh, 10,000 people and, I suppose, loosely 70,000 supporters. Uh, but it, 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 as anyone who will know who's managed an organisation, uh, 
going from a, a small organization to a large organization is very difficult, let alone um, in this adversarial security environment that we have to work in. No comment. Can you even say whether it was easy or hard? Is it something you expect to happen more often in the future? Or? Are, you, are you getting a sense that now that this is, you know, it needs to be quite complete, it's getting a lot of coverage that more people are going to follow suit and come forward with information? Are you already getting a sense that people are approaching you? That is our experience, that uh, courage is contagious, that when there is a significant source disclosure um, that is resulting in a media impact and appears that it's going to result in some kind of political reform down the track, um, sources are encouraged uh, by the opportunities uh, that they <coughs> see before them and step forward. Uh, so we expect that to also be true in this case. So the age of the whistleblower? I hope so. Uh, are you concerned at any point about the effect this might have on the ongoing um, investigation into the charges against uh, the PFC Bradley Manning? Yes. Okay. Yes, we were. Um, Mr. Manning is, there is no allegation uh, as far as we can determine uh, that this material is connected uh, to Bradley Manning. Uh, either in the sort of chat logs and evidence that has been uh, provided or um, as a result of the charges uh, that the um, US military have applied to him. Uh, but that said, he is a very high profile alleged source. Um, in fact, he's the only alleged uh, US military source. So there is, of course, a, a natural um, media tendency to uh, for anything uh, related to U.S. government or U.S. military to try and correlate this uh, to Mr. Manning. But uh, as far as we can see from the public record, uh, there is no uh, evidence of a correlation. Do you understood you right early on? You said you, you think you've got more correct details if the troops reported about others than themselves in yes. some incidents. Um, did you come across any differences uh, for the Germans, either way they reported? Th there are no reports in here directly from ger German forces. Uh, there are some reports by US forces saying what German forces uh, have told them, and there are reports by US forces on um, their interactions or encounters with German forces and others. But there are no direct reports in this material um, from any other group than uh, the United States Army and Marines. Sometimes there are reports that are given to regular Army and Marines and that are then incorporated into this material. For example, US Embassy cables. Um, uh, yeah. could, could you compare that which was made publicly knowledge to the German public in general, and they have a comparison there, then, the internal files and basically the official. I'm not across what the German public knows, so I can't answer. How do you feel about the uh, Taliban or Al-Qaeda using your material for their own publicity, their own propaganda? That's possible, but where publicity is based on the truth, um, we do not now call that propaganda. We did in the 1930s, but, but not anymore. That said, uh, this material uh, does not leave um, anyone um, look, uh, smelling like roses, uh, especially the Taliban. I mean, there are some reports in here, if you add up the figures of uh, 2,000 people, uh, civilians killed by IEDs. Uh, now, of course, uh, it is wrong to say that all those IEDs were planted by the Taliban, um, but they were presumably planted by rebel forces of some description uh, in Afghanistan. What do you think in the end this, the disclosure of these documents really signifies? I mean, I think you've said that this is the, 
uh, most comprehensive history of a war in terms of the raw detail ever to have been yes. printed. But yes. what, you know, what do you think that signifies? What, 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 what does it mean in the end? What will change? What might change? What should change? So this is the equivalent of opening the Stasi archives. Um, no one particular Stasi file uh, has a tremendous impact to change a whole nation, to change the whole nation of Germany. But across all the Stasi files, many individuals are represented and many people in German society could see their connection to the behavior of the Stasi. Uh, so I, it, and that's something that came out over time. So I expect that to be the case also uh, in this material. It is, the, it, is a, it is a history, it is an enormous compendium of material that will affect many different people in different ways. Um, we, as a journalistic group, the four media groups who worked on this, have really only just scratched the surface. I think between us we've probably read about a thousand or two thousand of these reports properly. So um, it's going to take the rest of the world press and academics to look at the statistics that uh, come out of this uh, and the soldiers and returned soldiers from Afghanistan, uh, from coalition forces. It will take the Taliban to look at this. The refugees from Afghanistan, the locals still living there, to all look at this and say, I understand that event, I was there. This is just a tiny summary. Let me tell you what really went on. That was my father. Uh, who was killed, that was my buddy uh, who was killed, that was my commanding officer who gave me an order that I was extremely uncomfortable with. Um, we, had, we saw things like that coming out um, when we released the collateral murder video. We saw two, S two US soldiers involved in that event come forward and give many additional details. We saw the sons and brothers of the journalists who were killed in that event come forward and give details. We saw the wife of the driver who was killed uh, in, in the van come forward and, and give additional details. So that's what I expect to happen with this material. And to some degree, it is of such scope that it eclipses the economic ability of the press to go through it. It's going to require not just the press, but all interested parties to understand this material. And that is why we have endeavoured to put it into a format that is easy uh, for people to go through and comprehend. Sorry, could I just follow up, just to understand you correctly, did you say that you have only gone through uh, in detail 2,000 of these, these 75,000 and 1,000 yep. documents? Well, how do you square that then with your uh, argument that this is a responsible publication and that you've done all the uh, harm minimization that you said? The, the documents are in many different categories. They are tagged with different categories. So we can see that some categories uh, do not have uh, the type of material that would, um, as an example, identify innocent informers. Looking forward to the future of WikiLeaks. What's your greatest fear? Well, things are going pretty well. So far, I mean, um, I, I suppose our greatest fear is that we will um, be too successful too fast and we won't be able to do justice to the material we're getting in fast enough. Um, that's our greatest problem at the moment. Do you accept that uh, secrecy is a, an important and a necessary part of government or not? Secrecy is sometimes perfectly legitimate. Um, for example, your medical records with your doctor are probably, in all likelihood, perfectly entitled to confidentiality. But not always. There will be some cases where that is not true. So you make the choice then? You, would you leave, would, would make oh, choice it's, this is a, a matter about whether the coercive power of the state should be used to stop people 
sharing information, who have no direct connection uh, to the source of the information. So you can't use the coercive power of the state to stop people spreading rumours, to, to stop people discussing political life. Um, and sophisticated US ju jurisprudence understands that. Uh, and that is why you have things like the First Amendment, which takes the press outside the legislative process, because in the end, it is the communication of knowledge which regulates the legislature, which creates the Constitution. Yes? Do you expect to be the main recipient of this sort of material in the future, or do you already see other rival whistleblower sites popping up that need to be watched and taken seriously? Unfortunately, we do not see any rival whistleblower sites. Um, we did have a, a grant application into the Knight Foundation to try and give our technology to every news organisation in the world. Uh, so, a submit, you know, so every newspaper would have submit this material uh, to us using WikiLeaks technology. But that grant application was rejected uh, for political reasons <coughs> after the collateral murder video. Um. Just to follow up, on, you mentioned four journalistic groups. Two, two quick ones is, do you see yourself accountable in exactly the same way the three other media organisations have to be accountable? And secondly, given those media organisations uh, focus on uh, driving a profit, what is the commercial arrangement between yourselves as WikiLeaks and these three organisations who are advertised, uh, etc.? There was no commercial arrangement. Ongoing in terms of the stability of WikiLeaks? No commercial arrangement at all. Uh, we we are, uh, have been blessed uh, over the past few months of, of receiving extensive report, support by the public, not by foundations, support by journalists and by human rights activists. We have raised a million dollars um, from the general public. Uh, as a result, we, have, we are um, are enabled to have a, a sort of fierce independence um, that larger organisations uh, find more difficult. That said, of course, we are also immediately accountable to the public because that is where all our money comes from, directly from the public, not from advertisers and not from foundations. Hi, what do you want to happen now in terms of the government's well, we would like to see this material, uh, the revelations that this material gives, be taken seriously, investigated uh, by governments, and new policies put in place as a result, if not uh, prosecutions. Uh, of those people who have committed abuses. Now, th this it's important to understand this material doesn't just reveal abuses. This material describes the past six years of war. Every major attack that resulted in someone being detained or someone being killed. That tells you how the war is going, where this happened, in what different parts of Afghanistan, what sort of weapon systems uh, were used, which particular military units. Is there a killer? Is there a killer unit in the United States military? Because there's been history to that. You can find out using this data. You can create a simple computer program. We haven't done it yet, but any one of your technical staff can create a simple computer program to add up the kills by unit. And get and find a top kill unit. So that that's an example of something that can be immediately extracted from this. So you can really see how the war in Afghanistan is going, and then compare that to government statements and government policy. This is the raw material that ends up on the big boards on the war room. There's even a field in there, decolor, which describes the colour that this material ends up when it's displayed on the big boards. This is the raw ingredients that lead to Pentagon statistics about civilian casualties, that lead to graphs about how many insurgents are killed. We only ever normally see those figures in aggregate, but now we have 
all the events that are used to create those figures and we can understand whether those aggregate figures are in fact accurate or are they distortions. In fact, we can see in many cases where we know what's in this database and uh, we have press sourcing or Afghan government investigation, we can see the disparity between these two. So we can see, in fact, the aggregate figures are based on faulty data. Following this up, combined with what you said earlier on, that it's a heavy ship, a ship difficult to turn around, and it has to come from the bottom and not from the top. Yes. Do you feel that the bottom is reporting in a way it's expected from them, or is it their opinion is so different from the top? We see a lot of exculpatory language in these reports from a unit talking about why it killed someone, I mean, why, why um, a convoy is going on a road, <coughs> car comes along, goes to overtake, they shoot the driver. And so that unit then reports all the things that it did. And you see, we engaged in escalation of force procedure and we told him to stop and da 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 da. But then what you, what you look is, if, if you look across these reports, you see an amazing number of civilians killed by ricochets. So we fired a warning shot and a ricochet ended up killing this person. I mean, it's, it's just not credible that that many people can be killed by ricochets. Um, so we, we see the, um, you know, it, it's like the, a, a policeman investigating himself filing his own report about an alleged crime that he's meant to commit, uh, alleged to have committed. Of course, um, that sort of reportage, internal reportage, is filled with errors. But that, it is those initial reports that then lead to investigations. So we can see the field credible allegations of coalition um, forces causing civilian injuries that field that was introduced about the same time as General McChrystal uh, took command, we see this unusually, sorry, um, applied to, in an unrepresentative way, non-US forces. So it's US forces talking about the Poles, it's US forces talking about the French, and that label gets applied. When a unit reports its own activities, that label never gets applied. Sometimes one U.S. military unit will apply it to the activities of another U.S. military unit. I mean, this shouldn't be any surprise if you have a basic understanding of how human beings behave. Um, but it does show that it is a hard ship to manage because the, the, the raw ingredients you need to manage it, the internal reporting, uh, is not accurate. So what are you going to do? So the top is relying on the information which might be... Anyway. That's right. There are, so there's distortions going up to the top, and then the top tries to push things down. We want you to report all the civilian kills. But of course, what incentives is there for a unit to report its own bad behaviour? Um, I was struck earlier on in the press conference, you said you couldn't draw a central lesson from this huge amount of material. Um, even the small amount that I've read seems to tally with what you find when you're in Afghanistan, which is that the primary catastrophic problem for the West is an utter lack of understanding of the Afghan people, where they are, who they are, what their motives are, what they're doing. A lot of what you've got here flowing is there from, was it civilian casualties, for instance? Yes. Isn't that the central... Well, I, agree, I agree, but what's your, what's your question? Do you draw the same central lesson? The uh, Afghan people are many, well, there's many diverse groups in Afghanistan having different economic basis, different language, different um, clan affiliations. Uh, and yet, US troops and British troops are essentially culturally homogenous and all go in there with the same sort of culture, but there's many different regional cultures in Afghanistan. I mean, uh, I feel that I would be drawing myself too much to um, 
uh, to agree with you, although I can see glimmers of that problem coming out of the material. But uh, the one thing is very clear to me, I mean, it's a, it is one damn thing after another. It is, it is war. Um, but we don't normally see war. Uh, through this material, we do see what war is like the every, at the everyday level, uh, as well as the big events, the whole lot. You know, um, when we released this Iraq video, uh, Gates, Secretary of Defense Gates, said that it was looking at war through a straw. And we only gave a 40 minute video and somehow that this lacked context, although we did give news reports uh, about what happened on the day. Um, but this, if you like, is the beginning, the end and the middle. Uh, this is the whole context, uh, with some exceptions, uh, of the Afghan war. And if anything can give us some kind of intellectual understanding, uh, surely this is it. Whether, whether it engages people emotionally is another matter. I mean, to some degree, that is the task of good journalism, is to turn this raw material, who, when, where, how, how many, uh, into something that emotionally engages people who can apply levers on decision making. Are you, are you concerned though, I mean, accepting the argument which I think is, is well made and I think most of us here would respect that, but are you concerned that in the process of releasing this information that actually you're going to do more harm than good, at least in some areas, talk about civilian casualties, what about the relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan? It's a very volatile view. A lot of the information about ISI involvement comes from MDS and apparently you know, biased or potentially biased yes. sources. Yes. You're releasing this onto the internet in a way that could in fact inflame at least an aspect. It's all about the Taliban, but there is another dimension, several other dimensions to the conflict. And are you concerned that this is all have you thought about that? Perhaps, and that you know, this is going to make that situation worse. Um, there is no perfect information. Um, but in the end, the truth is all we have, right? But you have a moral ethical response, I mean, we all do, to put information in a way that people can understand it and process it responsibly. I mean, there is... Well, I think we have done that. I, I think we have done that extremely well. I mean, we have 14 pages in The Guardian just here. That's not a bad outcome, right, journalistically. I, I mean, what more could you do? What about the security of the uh, troops in Afghanistan when you publish this material? The material is all seven months old. There doesn't seem to be any, uh, there's no, nothing about troop movements, no tactical uh, considerations in this material. So uh, uh, why, of course, I am not, um, I would always think about that issue before dismissing it out of hand. Um, we have looked at it and there doesn't seem to be anything significant. Uh, that said, I mean, the revelations of abuses uh, by US and coalition forces may cause Afghanis to be upset, and rightly so. Um, and if governments don't like populations being upset, uh, they should treat them better, not conceal uh, abuses that have been undertaken. undertaken. so much of this material that you publish come from US forces and not from other coalition partners such as the British? Actually we've published a lot of material from the British. Um, in fact the, the Ministry of Defence um, put in an order to British Telecom which uh, controls the gateway for MOD uh, and told them to block all connections going out to WikiLeaks uh, in an attempt to stop British forces leaking us material, um, or at least a stated attempt. Uh, of course, what happened in practice is someone who was responsible for counterintelligence got uh, some command from a more senior person saying, look at that thing on WikiLeaks, um, shouldn't you do something? And so they wrote a letter to British Telecom uh, instructing British Telecom to make sure that normal connections from in, inside the MOD couldn't look at our web pages. I mean, the result is that those senior people who complain about material that is on WikiLeaks are no longer in a position to complain because they can't read it. It's 
great. And no investigations because they can't see the material that's there. Um, we discovered this uh, using a proactive FOI that we routinely do for sort of uh, these sorts of organizations that might be trying to investigate our sources. 